Welcome back to No Budget Films, and here we are once again with a new Byzantine video. Here, we will go over another top 10 list, this time on who I consider to be my top 10 underrated Byzantine emperors. Now, in the past, I have done some videos on who are my best emperors and who are my worst. However, for this one, I will be briefly discussing who I consider to be highly underrated Byzantine emperors that actually did quite a good job for the Byzantine Empire, yet are not talked about that much. In this video, we will go over these 10 emperors in a chronological pattern, which in the traditional Byzantine sense begins in the 4th and ends in the 15th century. This video too strictly only covers the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire, thus we will not include any Western Roman or Latin emperors and not the emperors of Trebizond too. Before we begin, please don't forget to check out my Patreon, the link is in the description. Please consider subscribing to it, as your support will really help in making me continue doing videos like this. Now, let us begin. Constantius II, who is considered to be the second Byzantine emperor, is not as well known as his father and predecessor, the legendary emperor Constantine the Great, and his nephew and successor Julian. This is quite a shame as the emperor who ruled between these two legendary figures did a lot in keeping the empire together, and at the end succeeded in it. Constantius II, after coming to power in 337 in a violent manner, spent most of his reign at war with assassinated Persians under Shah Shapur II in the east in order to keep them away whereas his brothers fought each other for control of the empire. Constantius II too fought against usurpers, which ended in success despite losing a lot of troops. He too battled invading barbarian tribes in the Danube, whereas his Caesar, a junior emperor Julian, successfully defended the Rhine. If not for Constantius II's constant defending of the borders, the Roman Empire would be further threatened by the Sassanid Persians in the east, and had Constantius not named Julian his successor before his death in 361, the Roman Empire would have collapsed due to civil war. The 5th century Eastern Roman Emperor Zeno may not be in anyone's top lists of emperors, yet he did a lot especially in stabilizing the troubled Eastern Roman Empire of his time. Already when coming into power, Zeno was ousted from it by the incompetent Basiliscus, yet Zeno in 476 managed to regain the throne. In his reign, Zeno saw the fall of the Western Roman Empire together with numerous revolts against him as many saw him as unpopular due to his Isaurian origins. However, Zeno through cunning and intelligence managed to survive numerous revolts and plots against him, and such an example included getting rid of the Ostrogoth king Theodoric the Amal's threat by having him invade Italy. At the end, Zeno true enough died in power without being overthrown again. Thus, thanks to Zeno, the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire at his death in 491 was left in a far more stable state than how it was when he came to power. If Zeno can be thanked for stabilizing the Byzantine Empire militarily, his successor Anastasius I is the one to be thanked for stabilizing the empire financially. Yet like Zeno, he isn't very much remembered. After marrying Zeno's widow, the Empress Ariadne, Anastasius came to power and throughout his reign, he issued several economic reforms, which at the end proved to be so successful for the empire as a whole. Anastasius I's reign though saw major wars breaking out, such as the Isaurian War from 492 to 497, and the war against the Sassanid Persians from 502 to 506, together with social unrest, especially due to religious issues. Yet the empire still remained financially stable, that by the time Anastasius died in 518, Byzantium's imperial treasury had a surplus of 320,000 pounds of gold. Anastasius II further continued Zeno's success in stabilizing the empire militarily, and thus thanks to both Zeno stabilizing the empire by stamping out rebellions and Anastasius' economic reforms, the Byzantine Golden Age under Justinian the Great in the 6th century became a reality. Justinian the Great may have overexpanded the Byzantine Empire, which thus led to complications after his death in 565, which included foreign invasions by the Sassanid Persians, Avars, Slavs, Lombards, Visigoths, and Moors. However, one of Justinian's successors being Emperor Maurice managed to hold off these foreign threats in his 20-year reign. Maurice may not really be one of the most remembered Byzantine emperors, but as emperor he was more or less successful in keeping the empire together at such a difficult time. Although Maurice may not have had the best economic policies, which therefore led to the treasury nearly bankrupt that had triggered many military mutinies against his rule, he was at least successful in the battlefield and in securing peace with his enemies. 
against the Sassanid Persians, Maurice's appointed generals were successful against them in battle. All while in 591, Maurice managed to seal a lasting peace with them by installing his Sassanid ally Khosrow II on the Sassanid throne. Although the Byzantines in Maurice's reign were not entirely successful defending Italy against the Lombards, Spain against the Visigoths, and North Africa from the Moors, they were more or less successful in neutralizing the invading Avars and Slavs in the Balkans. The Byzantines could have even taken care of the Avars and Slavs for good, had Maurice not been overthrown and executed due to the mutiny of the Centurion Focus in 602. Constantine V may be one of the most despised Byzantine emperors according to historians for his extreme iconoclast policies that he true enough is remembered as the Zheng named. However, putting aside his bad reputation, Constantine V's reign was one of the most successful in Byzantine history. Although Constantine V came to power with a rough start due to a civil war against the usurper Artavastos, his reign saw the Byzantine Empire and its frontiers stabilized once again. After years of foreign invasions and anarchy, Constantine V may not have started restabilizing the empire as his father Leo III had already saved the empire from the Arab invasions and the anarchy, but it was Constantine V who began striking back against the Arabs. In his reign, Constantine V's victories against the Arabs in the east true enough broke the power of the Umayyad Caliphate in 750, which was then replaced by the Abbasid Caliphate who Constantine scored more victories against. In the north, Constantine V brutally crushed the Bulgarians in battle numerous times to the point of throwing them into anarchy and thus neutralizing them as a threat. Apart from his successful military campaigns, Constantine V too rebuilt Constantinople's aqueduct and was popular among his subjects for giving away free food. In the negative side though, Constantine V's reign had also seen the complete loss of Byzantine northern Italy to the Lombards. The 10th century had seen the Byzantine Empire bounce back against its foreign enemies and thus expand territory again, this time to all new levels. When it comes to these 10th century military emperors who expanded Byzantium's power and influence, many may think of the three being Nikephoros II Phocas, John I Zemiscus, and Basil II from the Macedonian dynasty. However, before these three, there was one major emperor who does not get much credit, yet he more or less began this territorial expansion. This was Romanos I Lecapenos, also from the Macedonian dynasty. Originally an admiral, Romanos seized power for himself in 920 after a complicated power struggle making himself the senior emperor and protector of the legitimate emperor Constantine VII, who he married off his daughter to. As emperor, Romanos I secured his hold in power by appointing his three sons as co-emperors and one as Patriarch of Constantinople. Although he too began his reign successfully by concluding the long war against the Bulgarian Empire of Tsar Simeon the Great. Romanos I's reign, though was most famous for Byzantium's expansion eastwards retaking territory lost to the Arabs thanks to his brilliant general John Kupkowas, who famously captured the city of Melitene from the Arabs in 934, making this Byzantium's first conquest of an entire Arab emirate. Romanos I, however, was not the last, as his sons and co-emperors deposed him in 944, only for them to be deposed by Constantine VII, though at least the success laid by Romanos I continued. Emperors with a very short reign do not really get much credit for doing something for their empires. Though this was not the case with the 11th century Byzantine Emperor Isaac I Komnenos, who had done a lot in only two years, yet isn't talked about that much. Following the end of the Macedonian dynasty in 1056 with the death of the Empress Theodora, the general Isaac Komnenos rose up in rebellion against the new incompetent Emperor Michael VI, who Isaac succeeded in deposing in 1057 after a short civil war. As a new emperor, Isaac I promised to restore Byzantium to the military glory it had under the Macedonians, particularly Basil II, and thus he energetically made reforms to strengthen the army and limit corruption. In only two years, Isaac successfully campaigned against the Pechenegs and Magyars in the Balkans, though in 1059, after falling severely ill, he unfortunately abdicated, and under the influence of the powerful politician Michael Sellus, he passed the throne to Constantine X Ducas, an incompetent successor. Isaac's dynasty though was not over as years following a number of catastrophes suffered by the Byzantines, the Komnenos family returned to power in the form of Isaac's nephew Alexios I Komnenos, who would reverse the declining situation Byzantium was at. When it comes to the Komnenos emperors that ruled the Byzantine Empire, most usually remember Alexios I Komnenos and his grandson Manuel I Komnenos, who were both great emperors. 
However, the emperor between both of them, being John II Komnenos, who was Alexis I's son, and Manuel I's father is the underrated one, as he is not as much talked about as his father and son. Immediately after coming to power following his father's death in 1118, John II already scored a number of victories against the Seljuk Turks in Asia Minor and against the Pechenegs in the Balkans. Furthermore, in his 25-year reign, John II was most successful against the Seljuks in Asia Minor and thus we took most of the territories Byzantium had lost to them in the past, whereas he too successfully campaigned against Hungary and made alliances with the new crusader states against the Islamic powers of the Middle East. Apart from being a successful military commander, John II further contributed to this era known as the Komnenian Restoration by constructing learning centers and hospitals in the empire while also being a wise and just ruler which therefore earned him the nickname John the Good. Following John II's untimely death in 1143 from a hunting accident, his success would be further continued by his son Manuel I. Although Byzantium may have fallen to the Fourth Crusade in 1204, when Constantinople became the seat of the new Latin Empire, Byzantine resistance continued with the empire in exile known as the Empire of Nicaea in Asia Minor. In 1222, shortly after the death of the Empire of Nicaea's founder Theodore I Lascaris, his son-in-law John III Vatatzes succeeded as emperor, although facing great opposition. Once clearing opposition against his rule, John III further expanded the Empire of Nicaea not just in Asia Minor but into Europe for the first time. Although suffering some setbacks due to the ambitions of his imperial rival with the despot of Epirus Theodore Komnenos Ducas, John III managed to secure more victories that he even almost took back Constantinople from the Latins in the Long Siege from 1235 to 1236 with the assistance of the Bulgarians under their Tsar Ivan Asin II. Had the siege not failed due to the Latins' reinforcements arriving and tensions breaking out between John III and Ivan Asin II, then Constantinople may have been Byzantine again this early on. Although this campaign was not successful, John III still regained most of Greece including Thessaloniki from the despotate of Epirus. By the time of his death in 1254, John III had left the Empire of Nicaea way stronger than he had founded it, making it a highly stable and prosperous state. Thanks to John III's efforts, the Empire of Nicaea in just seven years after his death managed to take back Constantinople from the Latins. Despite the Byzantine Empire restored in 1261, it suffered hard times in the following decades due to the rise of Western Europe, foreign invasions, and more than 40 years of incompetent rule by Emperor Andronikos II Paleologos. Thankfully, in 1321, the incompetent Andronikos II was challenged by his grandson, also named Andronikos, wherein both were against each other in a civil war that lasted seven years. This civil war ended in 1328 with the grandson victorious, thus becoming Emperor Andronikos III Paleologos and his grandfather abdicating. Now, Andronikos III may not be one of the best remembered of Byzantine emperors, though in his 13-year reign, he proved to be Byzantium's last great emperor in terms of making an effort to restore imperial power. As emperor, Andronikos III campaigned together with his close friend and trusted general John Cantacuzinos in taking back lost territory and these include parts of Greece and several Aegean islands, while they too restored the navy that had fallen into neglect. Although Andronikos III may not have been successful against the Ottoman Turks in Asia Minor, his rule saw most of Greece return to Byzantine rule with the conquest of the entire despotate of Epirus in 1338. Unfortunately, Andronikos III's death in 1341 was untimely, and thus due to it, Byzantium never saw its glory restored anymore. The Byzantine Empire may have had over 90 emperors, some were great ones, some were miserable failures, yet some were somehow great, yet don't get much attention. Hence this was the purpose to create this video, to shed some light on these underrated yet somehow great Byzantine emperors. Do you agree with this list of mine? I hope so. If not, please say so in the comments on who you think are other underrated Byzantine emperors. Before finishing this video, once again, I encourage you all to check out my Patreon site and please consider subscribing as it really helps a lot in making me continue making videos like this. Now, thank you all for watching.